Hi, my name is Victor Hugh, and I lead Goldman Sachs's education, technology, and services practice within our investment banking team. I want to thank Professor Paul Kim for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with this class. And Paul asked me to talk about a few things, to introduce myself and our team, and give you a sense of what we do, to talk a little bit about innovation in education, and finally, just to share some perspectives on the kinds of things that we're seeing uh, as we spend time in the space. So first, a little bit about ourselves. At Goldman Sachs, we advise, finance, and invest in the best companies that we can find in every sector, including education. And we do that generally by building long-term relationships with companies, with investors, and with other influencers in the space. In education, we have a global team of about 40 people uh, across various offices around the world uh, who touch the education space in some capacity from early childcare to companies in K-12 or higher education to supplemental education or corporate training and lifelong learning. We typically advise companies who are going through some kind of strategic transaction or who are in need of capital and would like to access the private financing markets or the public markets via an IPO. And in many cases, we invest in uh, growing companies ourselves. As a result, I have the privilege of talking to many different people in the sector uh, and maintain a broad range of dialogue with strategic companies and publishing uh, or media or companies who operate for-profit schools in K-12 or higher ed. Uh, we speak with a lot of investors, both early stage and later stage. We spend time with entrepreneurs who are forming companies or who are in the early stages of growing their ventures. And we also spend a lot of time with uh, folks in the public sector, uh, in the Department of Education or uh, in important, important foundations, uh, school leaders and union heads. So that hopefully gives you a sense of uh, uh, our team and what we do. Uh, now, on the topic of innovation in education, there are many different ways to think about this subject. Uh, and I tend to think about it quite simply as a new way of thinking or doing something that brings value to people or to markets. Now, the interesting question from my perspective is not so much the definition of uh, innovation in education, but why it hasn't happened more. Uh, in this particular space. And I think that it's been difficult to innovate in education for a couple of key reasons. Now the first is that education is traditionally thought of as a public good. And as a result there's a significant amount of government regulation and control over the sector. Uh, particularly with early education but certainly true of university post-secondary education as well. And that impacts who can teach who can learn, what content is taught, how many years a student has to be in school, in some countries what the tuition is, you know, what enrollment is, etc. All of these are either directly regulated or are significantly influenced by a variety of regulatory frameworks. Now the education value chain as a result has in most places been controlled by monolithic institutions and the private sector has been slower to develop. Uh, certainly in most countries though I believe that's changing now uh, around the world. And, uh, and that's at least one reason that innovation has been a little bit slower to develop in education. Now the second reason is influenced by the first and uh, that is that in the school systems of K-12 and higher education the end user uh, of a product or service is oftentimes not the buyer uh, or not the decision maker in terms of how a school's budget is deployed or invested. And the market structure uh, as a result is, is more top down than bottom up and it makes it difficult for products to evolve quickly to suit consumer needs uh, or changing customer tastes. Um, in Relative to for example industries like consumer electronics. Now relatedly market access and distribution to um, and users of educational products and services has also uh, been a challenge as a result, not only because of the gatekeepers, 
but in USK 12, for example, because of the fragmented nature uh, of our, our education system, with you know 100,000 schools, uh, 15,000 school districts, uh, etc. Uh, so without a sizable sales force, uh, it is enormously difficult for young companies to scale, and that has been an impediment to private sector investment in the space. Now, I believe that many of the barriers to innovation uh, in education are are falling now. And, uh, and that leads me to my third topic, which is just some perspectives on what we're seeing in the space. Now first, uh, the first thing we, I would say is that while education uh, has not been immune to change uh, and evolution, it certainly has been very slow uh, in evolving over time. But we're seeing that change. We're seeing some real disruption happening right now, and we see some of that change accelerating. Um, everything from how content is created to how it's distributed to what pedagogy is adopted in the classroom to who is teaching and who is learning that is all being redefined and shaped by uh, software and by the internet and a real unbundling or disaggregation of the education value chain is happening uh, the major themes that we are, are seeing impacting technology more broadly whether it be mobile or social or SaaS, uh, software as a service, they're all having a major impact in education right now. And companies are being formed to uh, leverage these trends. Uh, even the, the distribution problem that I alluded to in USK 12, that is beginning to be solved with the web, with companies that are distributing their tools and technologies directly to teachers, directly to students, um, circumventing schools and districts um, and the historical purchasing paradigm. Second, as a result of all of that, we are seeing a tremendous inflow of capital into education, uh, especially over the last couple of years. For example, just this year, according to our own research, we're seeing something like 10x uh, the amount of venture and growth equity going into education relative to just a half dozen years ago. This makes sense to us because Despite the challenges that I alluded to earlier, education is still a very, very big market. Uh, and we're seeing a very broad range of companies being funded. Now, some of the, the key trends uh, in this ed tech funding that we're observing include personalized and adaptive learning, um, higher education 2.0, so companies like Coursera and Udacity and the MOOCs, um, very much like Stanford's Venture Lab, as well as services companies in higher education uh, that are taking advantage of some of the changes um, and bringing their services to enable schools to access the markets uh, in new and improved ways. New language platforms, new content and digital textbook platforms, uh, as well as what I alluded to earlier, social and mobile. Now, I know that one of the subjects of this course uh, being taught by Professor Kim is around business models and education. So I thought I'd pause and give you a few examples of interesting companies that have developed newer business models that leverage the power of the internet and uh, advances in information technology. So while traditional for-profit education business is really driven by enrollment and tuition, or for companies that sell into the school system, for example, selling a software license into a school, these new businesses may make use of multi-sided markets or unbundled business models. So let me give you a few examples. 2U is a private company, a services company, that helps its partner universities bring uh, degree programs online. And it makes money by sharing tuition revenue on online students that are enrolled in its platform. Lynda.com is a subscription business that offers a library of uh, professional training and continuing education videos. Um, and they make that library available to individuals or corporate buyers through a monthly or an annual subscription. Uh, another company that we've gotten to know recently, a private company called Everify, uh, it's supported by a sponsorship model. Its core product of critical uh, life skill courses are offered for free to schools and to students, uh, but it makes money by licensing it, its platform to corporations, to enterprises who white label its courses uh, in their local communities. Uh, another example of licensing is Coursera, a MOOC, uh, like Stanford's Venture Lab, 
which similarly offers its courses for free to students, uh, but has begun making money by licensing its platform of courses to other schools. And it's also enabled its partner schools to um, charge for certificates of completion. Another company called MyEDU is an education platform that, like LinkedIn, allows students to create profiles uh, and, and it helps students to manage their, their courses and their schedules. And again, that service is free for end users, but MyEDU charges companies, uh, enterprises, subscription fee for accessing the data that it's collected around its students and enables those companies to target students with branding uh, or even with job postings. And there are many other examples of some of the unbundling that I talked about. It may be Chag, for example, uh, that charges students for individual textbook rentals, uh, or Udemy, which charges for uh, courses that you purchase online a la carte. Uh, but you get the picture. There's been a real proliferation of business models uh, in education. That's something I think that is very exciting to see. So that wraps up my comments. Uh, for this video segment. If you have any questions about anything that I've shared or, or you'd like to recommend a company for us to take a closer look at, please feel free to email me at victor.hugh, spelled H-U, at gs.com. Thank you and good luck with this course.